When you talk about musculoskeletal aging, Mm -hmm. um, it's now almost, it almost is having its moment, not quite yet, right? (laughs) You and I are sisters in this and um, it's not quite there yet. But from the time you are seeing a patient, Mm -hmm. there, there seems to be in different grades of aging. Mm -hmm. The young individual that you're seeing that pops her Achilles tendon Mm -hmm. versus the, I don't know, guy who is on a motorcycle, super healthy 30 year old, breaks his leg. To the postmenopausal woman, Mm -hmm. their musculature, their bone health, all is very different. Completely. Can you talk about some of the work? And by the way, uh, again, there was this amazing paper, Muscular Syndrome of Menopause. You were mm-hmm. the first, you coined that the first. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to me a little bit about what happens as we age yeah. from these different perspectives, both in muscle and bone. Mm-hmm. And then in menopause, because we're really behind the eight ball when it comes to probably arguably all hormonal changes, but in particular for women. Right. Well, I want since you've given me the luxury of this, I want to start back with the first work that we did at the University of Pittsburgh in the musculoskeletal aging in itself. So um, there was this big NIH-funded cohort study called Health ABC. Yes. It, yes. Of it course. Follows, I mean, you're, you of have, course. you're a geriatrician, right? Yes. So you know this. Yes. So, the, so it, it, one of the, the researcher, mm-hmm. Ann Newman, was at Pitt. Mm-hmm. So they followed a cohort of 70 year olds for a decade or so and just saw what happened. And one of the things they saw happening is the the quads uh, and the leg muscles in these people, for lack of a better ter- term, became grossly infiltrated with fat. They became well marbled. Their strength decreased. They became more frail. Having a father who has always been an endurance athlete seeing uh, I became uh, involved with the Senior Olympics, which you have to be 50 year old, 50 years old to compete in these things. You have to win your state games to go to the national games. They are some of the most fit people totally. I've ever seen. I can't believe 50 would be considered senior. Oh, and let me tell you, the 80 year olds are mad that the youngins are in the same race, <laughs> in mean, same group as them, it's right? true, 50 is not that old. It isn't very old. Right. I mean, I'll tell you, I'm way past 50, <laughs> but you know, the NIH describes, um, master's athletes is 35. I mean, come on, people. <laughs> but you know, if you look at life expectancy, it's younger than you midlife is younger than you think 35 to 40. I mean, yeah. people don't realize. So anyway, so Ann Newman was doing that uh, foundational work at Pitt where I was and I said, I don't believe it. I do not believe that that is our destiny. And so most aging studies are done on populations. What do we know about our population? 70% of our population does not do one extra step of mobility a day. So what we know about aging is what we know about sedentary aging. We do not know what we're capable of long into the foreseeable future. So my group and I, we called ourselves PRIMA, the Performance and Research Initiative for Masters Athletes, began studying all these master's athletes we had. We did a series of studies and basically in summary, what we found is you can preserve your lean muscle mass. You can preserve your bone density. If you do impact exercise, it's even better. Um, We can preserve uh, the, the, we can make satellite cells replicate again. Which is um, fascinating because, uh, and we can circle back to the satellite cell conversation because most people would say that the health of satellite cells is in no. youth and then there's no. senescence that happens, but yeah. yes. You can reverse it. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. And then the last study we did, well, there's two two remaining in that series, uh, took us, the, the brain study took us five years and this was long ago. No one was talking about the relationship between muscle and brain as we are now, thankfully. But uh, we showed that we can preserve three of the executive functions of the brain with chronic exercise. And then finally, right before I left Pitt, we started looking for the why, and we started studying a protein called Clotho, Mm -hmm. the longevity protein. And this is all in coordination with the lab of Dr. Johnny Huard, who's um, one of the leaders in muscle aging, and Dr. Fabrizio Ambrosio, who is a, uh, a physical therapist, PhD, who is just brilliant. And so I say that because as a clinician, no clinician ever goes as far as they do 
unless they're paired with a great PhD. I, and I want I to agree acknowledge with, I that. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. yeah. I, I wholeheartedly agree. So we did that series dispelling the myth that aging has to be a decline. And then most recently, I applied what I, the passion I have for that I learned taking care of women as a cancer nurse. I, I, I began doing work with Women's Health in 2012 um, before the crest of the wave because I think women are in the most powerful position to change the health of this country because we make 80% of all the healthcare decisions in this country for ourselves mm -hmm. and everyone we touch. Because I don't know about your husband, but my husband will go to the doctor if I make the appointment or he can't play golf or various other activities he likes. <laughs> <laughs> so no anyway. my husband is at the doctor every week he's like oh this is great free va care oh <laughs> <laughs> i think i should get a sleep study cardio echo where's how about the some list? acupuncture my va gives uh, all the guys <laughs> acupuncture it's but all for, good. but majority of the time most no. people are very just that's right where to follow up and yes don't take care of themselves that's true. at all which is why i always harp on getting blood work doing the just yeah. the basic stuff yeah your body's talking to you yes. whether you're listening or not is the yes. issue so yeah. you were saying that aging you know based on this earlier work that yeah. there doesn't have to be this decline of there aging does not. Mm -mm. um do we know that to be true in a meaningful way so let's if we were to think about the majority of individuals are fully sedentary. Mm -hmm. 70, 50 percent of Americans mm -hmm. don't work out. That's right. Over 70 percent don't even meet the recommendations mm -hmm. of uh, resistance training plus mm -hmm. cardiovascular. Mm -hmm. So that means most people are completely sedentary. Right. What we think of a quote healthy normal is a disease population. Inactivity is a disease population, period. What is normal actually, if you frame it, is being diseased and sedentary. Correct. The anomalies are people we know. that we care for or try to mm -hmm. care for, right? But I want to, your your whole mission is to pivot that. My whole mission is to pivot that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and my question to you is, at what point does an individual have to interject in midlife? Let's say we have a, mm -hmm. or even um, kids. Like at what moment yes. do we know and what activities from a practical standpoint do people have to take mm -hmm. to have a meaningful impact? And we could say from a metabolic standpoint mm -hmm. or even from you know a durability standpoint, you talk a lot about mobility, durability, collagen, tendon. How much is enough? How much, what is the min max? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is the and, minimum and, for the maximum? Yeah. Well, if you, if we were talking about our children before and I've just started to read this, I was introduced to this by the head of our metabolic lab but I happened to practice in this wonderland of technology um, our children are replicating their mitochondria and building the mitochondrial load and um, from the time that they're running around and so if we're raising a generation of children who are not act enough active enough to stimulate that that has lifelong consequences mm -hmm. right but what if what if we're not talking about children? When I maybe what you're asking me is two questions. When do we have to really get serious, and how much do we have to do? I mean, maybe those are the questions I'll ask. I describe a critical decade to get your shit together. If you have never thought about it before, and tell me if you disagree, I think between 35 and 45 is a critical decade because you're an adult, totally. you're settled in your career, you're hopefully you're out of your parents' house, you're. <laughs> You know, all the social Unless you're things. my child, you can stay. Yeah, actually, <laughs> come home, tagline at eight children. Um, but you know what I mean? Yeah, we have a little bit more agency. Yes. yes. At that point, oh my God, we're peeking out on our muscle. Mm -hmm. We're peeking out on our bone. And we still have our hormones, men and women. It's the time when we still have an active contribution. For women, Many women start the decline in estrogen at 40. We have we have one percent of our eggs left. It's a miracle I had a child at 40, right? I squeezed out a healthy egg. But before all those midlife changes start happening, it's a critical decade to start back on caring about what our heart does. Our VO2 max at that point, I like to talk about the frailty line of VO2 max, right? You've probably talked about this too, where if if we don't do something about it, every decade we decrease our VO2 max, which is 
our absolute fitness level, yeah. your crowd knows this, by 10%. So if at 40, your VO2 max is only 30, and you decrease by the time you're 70, you're going to cross the frailty line, which is 18 for men and 16 for women. So we need to do everything we can to maximize that. From a cardiovascular standpoint, I prescribe for people. I was of the generation where I was doing HIT every single day. I know. I heard that in an interview. Every single day. I was running marathons <laughs> and all the things that, and I have biomechan, I have kinetic chain issues. So when I'm training like that, I have a predictably because of my repetitive kinetic chain issues. I have Achilles tendon on the left. I have right hip flexor and my fascia on my left thigh. I, it's predictable. It, it sounds like a good time. Yeah.